Style appalling. Patent near fabrication from beginning to end. Just could be the real thing. Well, if it's genuine, it's gold dust. But its topicality makes it suspect. Smiley is suspicious, Percy. Welcome to Spybrary, by spy fans, for spy fans, with Shane Whaley. Shane dives into the mystery and intrigue of spy books and movies, both fact and fiction, delivering reviews and interviews with authors, historians, intelligence experts, and spy fans. He discusses everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Ian Fleming, Tom Clancy, Brad Thor, and many more. If you love spy books and movies, keep listening. This podcast is for you. This is Spy Prairie. Hello and welcome to episode 198 of the Spy Brewery podcast. Today, uh, we're tackling a movie that I've, I've been wanting to have this episode, host it for a long time. We're going to tackle the movie version of Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy. Uh, we're joined on today's panel, Jeff of Spy Right. How are you, Jeff? Hello. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. And also to mention, you have the Lacare cast and Barbican Station as well. And we'll put your podcast in the show notes, spybree.com forward slash 198. Uh, Long time listener, first time guest, Martin Reynolds from the UK. How are you, Martin? Hi, good to be here, Shane. Thank you very much. Great to be participating after uh, lurking on Facebook for rather a long while. Absolutely. We need more voices. We need more of our community to come on the show. So uh, hopefully, Martin, you coming on today will inspire others to come and share their insights and observations on the spy lit world. And last but not least, Matthew Tanner Bradford, 00 section. How are you, Matthew? I'm good. It's good to be here, Shane. Uh, thanks for inviting me to talk about the, this movie yeah this this one is is long overdue so it's the movie version 2011 um we decided that uh for the sake of time we wouldn't be comparing this with the tv series um because we didn't want to spend 30 minutes on that uh what we really want to dig into though is this movie and let, let's start with you matthew can you remember or can you share with us the first time you watched the movie where you were and what was your experience of it uh, yeah, I, well, I'd been extremely excited for it uh, going up to it, and I'd been covering it, all the casting and everything on my blog, Double O section at the time, like breathlessly, you know, following all the all the updates on casting and everything, and um, I, I couldn't wait because this was this was my favorite book, and if the movie was terrible, I was gonna hate it, and if it was great, I was prepared to love it, uh, uh, and I went in. You know, I was encouraged by the trailers. I liked that director already, but um, but I didn't know. And I, I saw an early screening of it at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood and um, went in and, and just absolutely loved it. I, I thought it was, uh, it just blew me away, um, especially the the production design the uh the the cinematography by Hoyta van Hotema, just the look of the movie. Um, it was, uh, I, I thought it was amazing and the weird thing, like I said, I was prepared to hate it if it wasn't like, if it didn't deliver on my favorite book and scene by scene, almost everything was different, but the overall effect was very faithful. And to me, that was just fantastic. When you talk about the look of the movie, because you, you work in this industry, so, so you know it really well, what was it about that look that excited you? Oh, it was, I mean, I think in Thomas Alfredson's movies, he he often does this, even even in his lesser movies. Like he's got this great uh, eye, really. So the camera in the in Tinker Tailor is always moving, almost always moving. You know, it's like a it, it's like it really makes you a participant in it, and it's great for a spy movie in particular because we feel like we are Gerald. You know, we're we're a mole in in the circus there. Just the point of view that we have of the mail cart or something, or or you know the constantly floating camera, or as he establishes the circus at the beginning, and we get each floor and and see all the, you know the the scalp hunters on one floor. You know, I 
there's a change from the book makes total cinematic sense to not have them in Brixton because you want that opening where you go floor by floor and meet all the different people. And there's, you know, there are your lamplighters, there are your scalp hunters. Um, you know, it's just so that, that moving, but then also just the design of the scenes, like the background that's behind, behind them in their, um, in their skiff or whatever it was called back then, but their, their padded conference room, um, which I don't think it comes in Tinker Taylor. We get one of those in, in the honorable Schoolboy. but what a great choice to put it in there because just that background of the yellow foam padding that formed like some of the posters, as well as, you know, so many iconic shots of the characters. Um, what a great visual and, and every frame is just filled. Like when you've got these, these wide exteriors, things like um, tracking, uh, um, Prado as he goes through the streets of Hungary and, and you're following alongside from, from like an obstructed view again, sort of putting the audience as a spy, but it tracks along with him in this great shot that's just filled. The frame is filled. You can see the other agent once you've seen it once and you know who the, who the agents are around him, you can spot them in that scene. You know, every frame is just filled with delicious little bits. Fantastic. Martin, how about you? When did you first watch it? Uh, where were you and how did you experience the movie? This would have been, I guess, I think it was B, um, short, well, pretty much in a cinema as it came out in a, a very wet day in Manchester, as it would have been then. Um, I'd not read the book for maybe hmm, 10 or so years at the time. And so it is, um, obviously, it's uh, played in my mind a lot of the time. I think, oh, you know, there's there's this chap called Smiley and suddenly seeing this come up as a film, thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be interesting to get into. New Gary Oldman's work, um, particularly uh, things like The Fifth Element and so on, and, and quite a hardcore cast. I mean, seeing just the, the, the cast who are then going into the the uh, film, the likes of Tom Hardy, who is a big up-and-coming uh, younger actor at the time. Um, Benedict Cumberbatch was uh, then coming off of Sherlock on TV, which is a big... Uh, show in the UK and just the uh, the visual like Matthew was saying that this is a really interesting film from a visual perspective the way time passes through it you know the, it's either the carts arriving or the the dumb waiter that delivers papers and suddenly that's the other day gone this gradual um, sense of dread for some of the characters you can gradually see pe some people Obviously, as parts are shown in uh, flashback, they get more sane the more flashback you see, and they get more deranged, as an alternative, certain other characters get more deranged as the film goes on. Um, and as ever, it explores your classic um, Le Carre um, themes of love, betrayal, paranoia between uh, other characters, and it's just uh, a wonderful thing, really. I can't believe when you, you listed the cast there that you didn't mention Trigger from Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> As Mendel. <laughs> Which only our UK yes. audience will know about. Yeah. Who plays Mendel. Yeah, well, you, you're waiting for you're waiting, waiting for Boise to turn up as Lacon at that point, aren't you? <laughs> so for our American uh, listeners and viewers, um, Only Fools and Horses is a very successful UK show. I don't think it was ever shown in the US, was it? I've, I've never seen it. I, I see Mrs. Bouquet over here keeping up appearances, but I've never seen Only Fools and Horses. So it's very dear to most British people's hearts. And uh, uh, Roger like Lloyd Pack plays quite an amusing character in that and, and did for many years. So to see him play a straight role was really interesting because I'd never, I'd only ever seen him play the Trigger character in Only Fools and Horses, Martin. So... Yeah, that, that, that was an interesting one. E equally, as, as someone who hadn't really appreciated Kathy Burke as a serious actress, um, which is a heinous crime in reality, she's really a uh, high-end actor in her own right these days, and well, she's actually given up acting to be be a, a stage director. Um, my immediate reaction was, oh, it's it's the uh, the woman who plays Waynetta Slob from Harry Enfield, which is, again, in a very specific uk um item of uh, uh, a, a comedy role um in the uk but again beautiful piece of casting um i'm sure we'll come to yeah. one of my favorite character john the carry characters in connie Sachs in a, a little while well um I, what's interesting is she came out of retirement to play the role um i was listening to the commentary with oldman and alfredson and 
they, they put it down to having worked with Oldman on Nil by Mouth, um, which is a very depressing movie. That's not one you want to watch on Christmas yeah. Day for sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think he directed that one, so that he brought out retirement. Jeff, let's cross over to you. Um, when did you first watch the movie? And uh, as a big Lacare buff, you know, how was it for you? Oh, it's great. Although I, I'm thinking back, I'm pretty sure it was in the theaters, and I, it required some finagling because I think we just had a, had a, you know, one year old at that time. So you know, babysitters involved to get out there to see it. But um, it was great. I loved it. You know, I I love those movies in this vein. Are I, I love anyway. And when you add in just the fact that it's you know Lacare and it's done so well. It was it was so much fun to see. So yeah, no, it was great. So with you and Matthew in particular being you know huge Lakari fans and, and reading these books way more than I ever have, was there anything jarring in the adaptation from from the book that didn't sit well with you? Um, for me, not not really. I mean, there were definitely things that they changed that were surprising, but I'm very much of the the mind that generally a film or a TV adaption is going to be a very different beast from a book, you know, and there's going to have to be things that change. And in general, you're going to want them to change because they're completely separate mediums. You know, I, I don't think you'd want to watch a book that is completely faithful and doesn't take any, any changes to, uh, mm-hmm. to ad- adapt for, uh, for film or TV. I don't know. What do you think, Matthew? You agree? Well, ultimately, yes. But in advance, I was that was one of the things that had me worried because something that had come out early, uh, you know, as little bits and pieces of the production leaked. I think Benedict Cumberbatch did an interview where he talked about we knew he was playing Peter Gwillem and he talked about Gwillem being gay, which is a big change from the character. Um, and so that kind of alarmed me because Peter Gwillem in the novels and the Carla trilogy is largely defined by his relationships with women in each of those books. So that sounded like, uh Oh, why, why are they making these changes that seem unnecessary and arbitrary? And then when I saw the movie, it was instantly clear. I mean, you could do in one scene, what it took Le Carre many scenes throughout the book to show in terms of showing the, detrimental effect that Gwillem's job at the circus has on his home life, you know, and he is not able to have a successful relationship. And because of, you know, how at, the t- at that time uh, being in a gay relationship would be a compromising position for, for an agent at MI6, it, you only need one scene to convey that, you know, oh, I get why he now has to end his relationship. Uh, you don't need the slow deterioration of his relationship with, um, uh, was she a flutist in the book? I can't now remember what instrument she played, but the the woman that he was seeing in the book. So it was just a brilliant bit of shorthand. And I, I think so many of the changes that they made, as I say, you know, I'm not sure there's any one scene that really is faithful, but the entire overall effect is so faithful. And I, I think it's all a matter of shorthand because you're taking a 300 some page book, 400 page book and putting it into just essentially a two hour movie. This is not like a, a 2020s movie that's bloated and and three hours plus this movie is just a little bit over two hours which is amazing for that for that length of book and they do it through economy of storytelling and uh you know they they find again and again ways to do in just one scene what the book takes many to do again they're different mediums so that makes sense and and i Overall, um, I was fine with all the changes as I realized why they were doing it. That said, there there are two that kind of rankle me. One is the arbitrary changing of Sam Collins to Jerry Westerby. Um, I mean, I could see making a composite of those two characters, but what they end up with is really just Collins, but calling him Westerby. And uh, and number two, um, just that Roy Bland gets such short shrift, and I, I, that one I understand completely. I mean, it makes sense if you've got to eliminate the, you know, the time spent with the suspects. But I, I, you know, like Smiley's interaction with him in the book, and would have liked to see that. But I understand why they had to cut it. Do you think? Okay, this is, might be a hopeful thinking on my part, but bearing in mind this is twenty eleven. Do you think they had the Stephen Graham actor play Westerby because they thought about Honorable Schoolboy and bringing him back into that role? Yeah, I think that was part of part of the casting for sure. I think they uh, that may be why they 
use that name just to set someone up, but it, that ha- it has me scratching my head too, because he's such a different character from Westerby yeah. that then if they had done honorable Schoolboy, they would have had to significantly change it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I first watched this film um, on a long flight to the States from the UK and, and I remember it vividly because I enjoyed the movie, but I was scratching my head because I'd never read the book. I'd only at that point read A Small Town in Germany uh, by Lakari. And, and what it did, as soon as I got off the plane, I got myself a copy of Tinker Tailor because I thought, I don't understand what I've just watched here. Like, <laughs> I need to go read the book. And, you know, when I see people online being very critical of the book and I'm always like, yeah, but this was my my gateway for Lakari. That opened up reading all of his work and and discovering it was one of you know my favorite authors. If it wasn't for that movie, maybe I never would have picked up a Lakari, which is crazy when I think now. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that movie being uh, being produced. That's great. I mean, anything. And when when people complain about new versions of things, it's it's a common refrain online that you'll see as soon as something is announced that is either a remake of an older movie or a or a new adaptation of a of a classic book people immediately you know the knee jerk reaction is to moan and whine about it and that what you just said completely 100% justifies doing new versions of things like it gets new audiences to these authors like um you know i think that's part of the reason that Land Dayton is not regarded in the same respect as John le Carré today because there just haven't been as, as many uh new adaptations of his books into other mediums over the years to really sink it into the public psyche and to get new people on board you know i really hope that the recent adaptation of the ipcris file served that purpose and got at least at least a few new people but you know if it gets anyone and and shane like not only did it get you to read John Le Carre, but it got you to ultimately read Land Dayton, read all these others, and create a podcast and a community based around this stuff. So, I mean, we have a lot to thank uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier <laughs> Spy for. No, you, 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 you're very, uh, you're spot on with that. Um, Jeff, do we know what Le Carre thought of the movie adaptation himself? Um, I think from everything I've read, he thought it was great. I mean, I think he he loved Oldman's performance in it as well, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, you know, there's some I, I'm just finishing up reading his book of letters and um, you know, he he has some correspondence with Oldman in there that uh you can read and you know, I think he was very happy. I mean, and he appears in the movie as well. You know, mm. he gets his little cameo in, which he kind of started doing with that. So in this this great, uh, as Matthew said, scene that is nowhere in the novel and yet is so crucial for the film, right? Why do you think that scene's so crucial? Well, it, it you know, it sets up uh, all of the inner dynamics for Smiley and Hayden and um, lets you see everybody, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's one of those scenes that, you know, once you see that, um, things start to fall into, into place, especially when you get to see little snippets of it throughout the whole movie. I mean, I, I don't know. What did you think? Do you guys agree? Is that like the, the crucial scene in that, in that film? Yeah, I think the party scene is quite a good little, um, metaphor for pulling, pulling pieces together each time, you know, we, we we'll, we initially see it. Oh, they all they all just get to getting together, or it's you know it's controlled. Who we've seen in the pre-title sequence? Oh, yeah, he's taking the the mick out of um, Alaline for not drinking or not preparing the uh, punch in the correct way, and Penny so on. Pinching Scott, and gradually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's something about you, you Calvinist swine. You couldn't organise a drinking session in a brewery or something, isn't there? And I think that that works really well because it, if if you have not entirely grasped who each of the people is within the the film, you've got that as a reference periodically to go back and okay, yeah, that's that's Bill and Jim talking there, or that's there's a reference to Anne, and and you can kind of piece it together. Um, I think one of the other important things that I noticed from the adaptation and, and in thinking about it that isn't in the book is um, these additional scenes that we get with um, Lacon and Roy and Percy discussing the intelligence and how that's going to be brought forward, uh, the services being reshaped and then their influence and 
they, they're into play with the minister, which uh, serves to show us, look, this is getting further enmeshed and becoming a bigger mess, while Smiley's kind of trudging along in the background, trying to work out what on earth's going on. Yes, he knows there's a mole and what he's going to do about it. But in the meantime, life continues as normal uh, for the rest of the service. And that's into play, um, certainly between um, Lacon and uh, Percy and Roy. It's a, it's, I, I think that's another great little scene in its own right. And you know, it's funny you mentioned that, Martin, because I, I did watch it again this morning and that scene did uh, appeal to me as well. I, I, I kind of glossed over it in the past and that's what I love about Tinker Tailor. There's always little parts of that movie when I go, oh, I didn't realise that or I didn't spot something or mm. it, wasn't, it didn't resonate so much at the time. And I think that scene, you've got Roy Bland kicking off about you know how they are protecting the West from... A third world war, and the minister's like buttering his toast. He's buttering his you know, toast. Yeah, he, he doesn't give a toss. He's not listening to them at all, is he? You, you, you just see Roy suddenly go, Ah, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so that was great, you know, and I'd never really picked yeah. up on that before. So there's a lot in it. And that's another bit that kind of borrows a little from, from Honorable Schoolboy in terms of the relationship with the Americans that really comes into the fore in that. And, and uses it well in this through uh, you know through through that minister character um, everything you're talking about like it's interesting that they kind of pull things like that skiff you know they pull some things from the other books in the series and uh, you know not in any way that would would have hurt those if they'd done those books but they really use use that stuff well <laughs> well I just I gotta say I mean there, we wa- I wa- watched it again this morning as well and there were so many things that you pick up on especially in in a rewatch there's so many smart decisions that they make in how they're filming like you know things that they add in like the smiley getting new glasses right and so he's coming into his home with this new kind of sight and he's looking right at that painting that we later on see is what hayden has given i mean stuff like that it's just like all of these sneaky little clues and things that they're dropping in there and and ways that they're um making decisions that are just so smart storytelling wise and visually i mean it's such a visually beautiful um film to watch that scene where we're on the tarmac i mean that just blows me away every time i see that with the plane coming into land right behind uh smiley it's so cool you know everything about the way that movie was filmed is amazing yeah and seeing how esther house is terrified about being put back on that plane and sent back to hungary you know, the, he, he, David Dentrick plays that part very well, I think. Yeah, no, it was that, that's, that scene is so cool. And like the, the effort they had to go in there. I mean, Matthew probably can talk about it better than I can, but like using specific lenses to get that very uh, dynamic look, it looks like the plane is like giant right behind them. It's so cool. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah. I, I mean, Hoyta van Hotema, like I said, he's just, he's a, a really top DP, um, you know, he he also went on to do um, uh, the Bond movie Spectre. He's worked with Chris Nolan. You know, uh, he he does. It's always uh, great to see his work. But yes, you're right. The the lenses that they use are really impressive because they do some crazy focus pulls in this movie too, where you go from background to foreground, and you know, or or you see you have these huge wide shots where everything is in focus. You know, I'm not sure what they shot on. I'd be curious to know, but. Um, and those details that you mentioned too, that you can pick up on later viewings of like noticing that that is the painting that uh, Hayden gives gives to uh, Anne and stuff like that, or or um, or that Carla is in one of the windows in the setup scene in um, you know uh, in Hungary when they, we then later get the flashback seeing the the lighter. Um, yeah, once you've seen it once, you can pick up on all these other things. Um. That I also scene, think Matthew, that, that scene, sorry to interrupt, but that scene, yeah. again, and, and you know this because it's your industry, but they, they, they really hone in on the lighter on the table of Carla with the message and it zones in and then pulls back out again. I think it's very yeah. well done. Yes, yeah, I think it is too. And you know what's interesting? We're talking about all these extreme uh, visuals, sort of like just how how visual they make. And of course, the scene with with Esther Heisey in the book is not in front of an airplane. You know, a lot of these things 
are brought in to to adapt that book, which is a very cerebral kind of book that happens largely in people's heads, to adapt it into a visual medium. And and that stuff's great. But then we have the one thing where um, one big major scene that is not done that way. There's nothing visual about Smiley recollecting... Well, uh, sorry, not nothing visual, but there's nothing visual in a flashback about Smiley reminiscing about meeting Carla in their in their first meeting. Instead, they choose to just focus on Oldman delivering this this very powerful monologue. And that's a very interesting choice because you know, in, um we're we're not comparing it to the mini series at all, but just that's something that we we saw that it's just an example of how someone else might do that is really showing that scene or in an earlier draft of this this movie by uh peter morgan uh who became more famous for the crown afterwards he had done a draft of of tinker taylor and in, in his version he really had visualized the dynamic between smiley and carly like it opened with them looking at each other through binoculars on opposite sides of a spy swap and and throughout would go and the lighter you know right right from the start you got the lighter and then uh that scene was certainly played out like in you see it in flashback as opposed to just this monologue but it's very interesting that alfredson and and the screenwriters of this one bridget o'connor and peter strawn choose to do this without a flashback because you get so there is a cool visual element to it, which is just the the iconic kind of shot of of uh, Gwillem and Smiley together in this um, dingy hotel room, very underlit. Um, again, a different setting from the diner where it takes place in in, in the book. But um, in this, you get it's really Oldman's. I I think that that is his his big moment of the movie is delivering that monologue and. As you get it, the camera pushes in on him. So we're in an extreme close-up um, of of Smiley. His glasses really kind of taking his eyes out of the equation because we get we get a there's a, um, a sort of um, flare on them. So you're now asking this actor to perform a lengthy monologue to the camera in a visual medium and explain key elements of the plot and do it without like even fully using his eyes because they're sometimes obscured and Oldman just nails it. Like it's amazing. As we go into that close up, he brings out the complete intensity of that meeting with Carla and, and then concludes it by saying he doesn't remember what he looked like. You know, it, it's, it's amazing. And you couldn't have done that without an actor of Oldman's caliber in that role. So I wonder actually if they rewrote that scene once Oldman was on board, because you really needed someone you could trust to turn that major bit into just being delivered by a monologue. And it's very brave of Oldman to take on this role, right? I mean, like I said, we're not comparing this with a TV show, but to follow in Guinness's footsteps, that's, that's a big gamble, isn't it? For an actor to do that. Yeah. yeah to follow Guinness. Yeah, it was, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and Oldman wasn't the first, of course, Denim Elliott had done it since then, but Whoever talks about Denim Elliott as Smiley, you know, like, yeah. Guinness we will soon a, a, on the next episode of the John Le Carre movie. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent plug. <laughs> um, yeah, he made a huge impact and it's a, a, a major role for someone, for anyone to step into. And I, I, yeah, I wonder how daunting that, well, I mean, Oldman's talked in interviews about, about it, but um, I, that was also to me an X factor going into the movie to begin with. I was I couldn't quite see old man. You know, he's a great actor who disappears into so many different roles, and that's kind of his thing. He makes it, you know, he loses himself in the character. But in advance, you know, I really wanted Jim Broadbent to be cast as Smiley when they announced it. I couldn't really picture Oldman. He seemed, for one thing, too young, and for another, too thin. But of course, he he completely, if not transforming his body, which he did to some extent, but not the extent that he has now as Jackson Lamb. But he through his performance you know he he transformed himself and really just took on that character i don't know jeff what did you think about the uh his sort of becoming smiley and was he what you had in mind you know i don't i don't wouldn't say he was what i had in mind but i loved what he did with it i mean and then you know i think they did him so many favors just in the way that they filmed the show or the movie i mean um he doesn't talk for like 20 minutes into the film right i mean he's just this kind of imposing figure throughout and like so when he does speak you're like on the edge of your seat to hear what is he going to say now that he's finally speaking i thought that was so 
smart and so so clever. There's also that scene, Jeff, with the bee when they get in the car when they pick up Mendel, and you know Willem's trying to like get rid of the bee when he's driving, and then Smiley just like opens the window and it comes out. So again, no dialogue or anything, but you're seeing this guy who's totally in control. Yeah, uh, they they made so many smart choices in in showing and not necessarily telling for what we're yeah. supposed to think about this character, right? How was Smiley for you, Martin? How was Oldman's portrayal of Smiley for you? It's what Jeff was saying about this first 15 minutes where we're after the, the, the uh, title sequence is the astonishing bit that, that is the thing that I, I wrote down on my first uh, rewatch of this last weekend. That he's got 15 minutes just being still and pottering around, you know, getting his glasses changed, going for another cold swim in the in the uh, serpentine or whatever the, the bathing lakes are on Hampstead Heath and and very little happens at times with Smiley he, he's sort of just this um, almost like a, a viewer to each of the scenes that we're we're at you know um, the the uh, the scene where he's um, been finishing um, uh, interrogating Ricky and Gwillem turns up and you know, there's an incident. Let's leave it at that for the time being. And Smiley just sort of looks up from his papers and sort of almost uh, nods across the room. Oh, well done, Peter. And uh, but nothing said. You know, the, the, this this script mm. is um, crazy in that uh, the guy has so few lines, but just so much impact. As you say, the, the simple little thing of oh, I'll open the window to let the bee out, or. Um, it's all restrained until we get to really the end of the film where he's um, he's almost let off the leash, as it were, with both uh, Bill and the minister um, beforehand of, of saying, no, look, I know what's going on. This is the scenario. You deal with it. Really fantastically nuanced and quiet all the way through. Um, and Oldman is just superb at just being so quiet all the way through the film really impressive he raises his voice just the once in the movie uh in the, the finale which i think even makes that even more poignant i think what are you then bill what are you yeah yeah um I, I, I want to take you back to the very beginning of the scene because kind of what struck me this morning, because I was looking at it with more of an analytical mind than just watching a movie, and that opening scene when um, Predo goes to Control's flat, and the first bit of dialogue you hear is, trust no one, Jim, especially not in the mainstream. This is not above board. Nobody knows. And, it, you know, it, it's only in the, f in the first four minutes they're able to give you what this story is about, that there is a mole. And there was a hunt on. I think they did that very well. I love, and it's dark, and you go into that very cluttered controls apartment. Um, I, I liked how they kind of set the scene, as it were, in, in that opener. How was that for you, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's control is is kind of feeling a little out of control in those scenes, and, and yeah. I, that's the thing I really enjoy about. That I mean, yeah, obviously they had a great actor um, f for to playing that role, but you know, it's just you're kind of wondering what's going on I immediately. You know, for folks who aren't familiar with the story, like I, I went with my wife, and s so it's like, okay, and did you get what was going on? You didn't get the one-year-old to see it? Come no, on. no, we, we, we left them at home, you know. I did. Well, and seeing this, you know, seeing this movie, how, how it treats mothers, uh, that was a little rough at, the, at that opening sequence. So, Oof, um, no, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, what, what I thought was interesting is, you know, talking to her, she followed the whole thing. She did, you know, unlike unlike Shane, she didn't have to run and, and find the uh, the book. No offense, Shane. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I do think they did a good job of kind of of giving just enough. You really, I mean, and it, it's, it, it's almost on the edge there, I would say, probably, of being just a little too opaque. But like, they really, you know, give you just enough to follow along and keep up, but you really have to be paying very, very close attention. Yeah, I agree with that. You can't be noodling around on your phone when you're watching this movie. Like, you, it demands complete attention. 
Yeah, I think that was a, a sort of jarring fact to many audiences, particularly probably ones who hadn't read the book, in that we're so used to movies now spoon feeding us exposition and often repeating it multiple times. Like if you go to most blockbuster type studio movies, if there's something crucial that you need to know, you will get it again and again. Or in the spy genre, you know, look at like the first Mission Impossible movie. How many times do you hear about the rabbit's foot throughout, you know? And that's a confusing movie. But still, we get again and again, we're, we're sort of told what the MacGuffin is. Whereas in Tinker Tailor, they don't repeat anything. There's really no repeated bit of exposition. They give it to you once. So... Like you say, if you noodle around, if you if you were to go to the bathroom during the screening and come back, you would be lost. And if you're watching it at home and like me, you've become like your mind's become addled by phones over the years. And, you're, you're you know, if you if you try to distract yourself and you look down at your, your phone or something, you're going to lose the plot completely. Um, you need to pay attention to every scene. And that's, again, that economy of storytelling from from Strawn and O'Connor, like it's not just finding new ways to uh to convey what the themes of the book and it's not just finding visual ways to tell the story it is both those things but it's also you know they're just very very uh sparse with with giving out that exposition they they don't have time to repeat things so they don't mm. you know they don't want to waste our time telling us this again and again so you've just got to pay attention but it also serves the purpose of sort of like putting us in smiley's shoes granted i mean he's pouring over documents he can go back but it does again make you sort of you know at that point he's an outsider to the circus coming in to do this investigation and it, it wrong foots us as the audience you know we are we are in over our heads and we realize that early on martin who else stood out for you in the cast i really like tom hardy as ricky tar um he's got this sort of well Immediately, you see the guy in his, in his sheepskin jacket going down the, the, the street in uh, Istanbul and think, oh, that's a cool guy. And But his, his, his presence um, immediately, once he's, he's talking um, of setting up uh, the interface with uh, Irina and so on, and that, that works beautifully. But the, the, the scene for that really made me astonished by... Uh, Tom Hardy was when he's um, finally at Smiley's house and the guy's absolutely out of his mind with worry and, and shaking and it, partly in tears for part of the scene as he's explaining, you oh, know, Mr. Smiley, you, you've got to help me. There's definitely this mole. Um, I've got all this story to tell you about what went wrong in uh, Istanbul and the movement of the Russians he thinks someone's on his tail and, he, and he's going to be the next one in line to get the bullet after um, his controller in uh, Istanbul it's a fabulous um, piece of acting from Hardy uh, really very impressive um, really enjoyed him so much so uh, you know <laughs> um, there's almost too much of him than when he comes up against Cumberbatch because the, you know, there's a little bit of uh, fisticuffs at one point in one scene it's almost not believable because hardy's such a good presence uh, in terms of the this big beefcake lump of tar and then we've got this slightly spindly benedict cumberbatch as he was then trying to give him a good hiding and it doesn't quite work in my mind uh but yeah, you set that aside otherwise it's it's really good but i really enjoy this this uh this interpretation of ricky tar very very thorough and uh he's a proper hard nut you know, it's something I don't think necessarily um, Le Carre's books ring, bring out so well, quite how hard some of the hard men are. Um, certainly this film does that. He is sitting down when he gets, uh, when uh, Gorham gets the best of him, at least. They, yeah, that's they, true, they Matthew. That yes. Much. Yeah. <laughs> Plus... But, uh, well, I agree, Martin. I, I just think that's some terrific casting. Not only is, is Hardy great, but just putting him in the role. Because Hardy was already a movie star at that point. You know, he he had headlined movies of his own, and now he's in a fairly small part in the, in the, the story. But it reminds you that another writer could have taken Ricky Tarr as the main character. In fact, many would have. Like, he is, what is a scalp hunter, if not a double O or, or a sandbagger? You know, they're the, they're the hard man, as you say. They're the field man. 
Um, for one who who falls in love in the field, you know, and, and just cares about getting Arena to safety and doesn't see the bigger picture, so many spy movies are from that point of view, of the man in the field who's being kept out of the bigger picture by his bosses and, and is going rogue for love. But no, he's just a, he's one of many moving parts in this. And, and like you say, casting Hardy in that role just really kind of, it, it makes him fully alive. And he, he feels like a co- an equal co-star, even if he only has a few scenes. Yeah, but Matthew, I mean, come on. If you're him reading this script or his agent, he gets basically a mini movie right in the middle where he is the lead, you know? I mean, he's telling the story. You know, he gets like, I, why wouldn't you want to do that? That's your be- that's your perfect Best Supporting Actor nomination right there, don't you think? Yeah, and as he said, he got to spend uh, a week in Istanbul with his dad. Like, <laughs> That's like... Yeah, I can see. I certainly see why it appealed to him. I was surprised, though, to hear him say in that interview on the DVD that he um, didn't read the book. Yeah. Oh wow! You know, the one thing that was funny about him, though, is he did have a little bit of a, a Hobbit feel to him with the Mister Smiley. I it, maybe it's just because I've just watched Lord of the Rings, but every time he's like Mister Smiley, I, I did this, and then <laughs> I couldn't right. help but thinking to uh, do a little bit of uh, Hobbitness there. Sam Gamgee. <laughs> yes. I love the sheepskin jacket, I have to say. I want one. Um, so if anyone's got one, drop me a note. Extra large. Um, <laughs> also, I think going back to, to what Martin was saying about it being a mismatch, for me, Gwillem was so pissed off that, you know, he says, like, I've just spied on my own for you, you know? And I think that anger, you know, sometimes anger can uh, equal things out when it comes to having a rumble, right? I mean, he's really angry about, about him thinking that he's defected and just rocked up here at uh they're they're using controls flat aren't they there at that point um yeah yeah well well and i i thought that you know the one thing that i liked too about that dynamic is the one thing that he wants is to save her right and mm. that's the one mm. thing that that when smiley knows the truth about what happened to her after he he goes out to visit uh, Prido, right? So, you know, he's like, oh, yes, we'll do our best. You know, that shows, you know, his ruthlessness in a way that I thought was really effective. Yeah, and I think also when you see uh, Tufty murdered and he says something like, oh, yeah, I can't take my hat off. That's how I would have done it. Yeah, or like when he talks about how he recognizes that Boris is is a hood. He's like, we know our own, you know, like, yeah, he conveys that well. You know, I really like that, as you put it, Jeff, that kind of mini movie in the middle. They, they tell that story again with economy, but it's believable that he's, you know, won this woman's confidence and, he, you know, he's carrying a torch for her, etc. And that one, we talk about the, the film techniques, but that one shot where he's in his hotel room watching and you see the entire scene opposite of Irina coming in, going past the two minders and then seeing her husband banging that woman in the bedroom. It's all there in one shot. Beautifully, beautifully done. Yeah, yeah that's bit. another amazing bit of focus, like having all that in focus in such a wide shot. And yeah, really conveys that sort of spy point of view. Yeah, great uh, takeaway from rear window there, right? The other thing that I discovered that I, I thought was quite interesting. So where the circus is, uh, so they filmed it in Hammersmith. But when they're on the top of the building looking down, it's a digitally created office block. But the the whole way that I love the production design of just creating that 70s um, uh, London look. And it may not be, uh, you know, uh, on, on the Spyberry forum, Jason King complains about the uh, the, the wigs and, and the 70s hair in that. And I get it. If you were there, it may not equal it. But it's not about accuracy so much as verisim- verisimilitude where to me who didn't live in the in the 70s london this world is fully created it's almost like jeff just made the comparison to lord of the rings in a totally different way but that movie you know those ser- movies did a great job of creating a world and integrating cgi you know but cr- creating a whole world that you believed and that's what alfredson does here in 1970s london is as alien to many audiences today as as middle earth you know and and they create this world fully um from the from you know bringing london back to that time through cgi to the skyline i mean to uh to the the clothes the costuming that sheepskin coat as you said amazing um to uh, yes even the hair i would say it may not be accurate but 
it feels like it is, you know, because how do I know the seventies, uh, seventies London? I know it through, um, videos of glam bands, you know, and stuff. And the and, Sweeney. Yeah. And the Sweeney. Exactly. And those are the haircuts that we tended to see in the Sweeney. So maybe it wasn't what everybody had in real life, but you know, when, when the Sweeney came knocking at your door, chances are you had a crazy Jim Prado kind of like, like long shagginess, you yeah. know? Um, so to me, it, it worked, even if it wasn't what everybody had, like it conveys that time and that place just amazingly. And I feel like I'm in a different world. How was the set for you, Jeff? Um, I thought, yeah, all the set design stuff was great. And I think they used it so effectively because, you know, at the beginning, we get this look through the circus, right? You know, we see everything set up and it sets up for future things that we're going to need down the line. And it all leads up to that great sequence with um, Gillum where he's trying to steal the the record book, right? I mean, it, yeah, the set design there where it's just the tension keeps mounting, you know, and it, it all plays so well. I mean, I think that that if you have to ask me my favorite part, I think that sequence right there is is probably the best. It's just so you're so invested, you're so so caught up in the whole thing. And and it's that grittiness too of of the look of the film that really makes it feel like you're watching something from that era to a certain extent too. You know, I, I feel like they fil- they went time travel back into the seventies to film it. Yeah, and I love that that constant orange and black that they have in in the sets. It it, it does scream seventies to me. I mean, I, okay, I was born in seventy five, so I don't remember any of it, but it it does scream that era to me. Smoke filled. Yeah, the rooms colors. And... You're right. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing that was kind of fun was, and I think this definitely is a throwback to the seventies. I'm sure Jason King would have done this himself. Was um, <laughs> when Westerby's working the night shift, and he sat there and he's eating his dinner. And he's got a couple of cans of beer. You know, and he's got his little cop bed there. And he's drinking beer on the job. That wouldn't happen today, right? I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I like that little nod. Yeah, and that one is right from the book. Uh, it's great, uh, and the soundtrack too. You know, it's not like a, um, it, it's not like a, a sort of greatest hits of the '70s thing, like you would get in like a Marvel movie that took place in the '70s, where it would be like the number one radio thing. It's like songs that are kind of cheesy you know or that that wouldn't uh um yeah it, it doesn't make you want to live in that time you know hearing but it's, it feels like everyday life like what you might actually hear on the radio because you know when you turn on the radio now it's not like you automatically get the thing that everybody's going to remember of this era you know like in fact a lot of the songs are older i love uh, that christmas party scene as we discussed like a crucial scene another reason we know it is they go back to it three times throughout the movie including at the end and and the songs that they play i mean one of the things i just love about this movie is that they play sammy davis jr is the second best secret agent in the whole wide world which is the theme song from this tom adams like bond ripoff euro spy movie and and it's such an obscure song, you know, but even then it was, you know, a decade old, but it makes total sense that the Secret Service would latch onto that and get, I mean, I don't know how they got the uh, the LP or, or the, the single of it because it's very hard to find that particular recording. There was never a soundtrack issued of the movie. I've looked and looked, but it's just the perfect kind of song that they would, they would have for a Christmas or a Christmas party, you know, like, yeah, fantastic. It's, it's interesting talking about the soundtrack itself. So Iglesias um, composed it and I, I listened to it in isolation this morning. Actually, I downloaded it off Spotify and I took my dogs out for an hour and listened to it. And I have to say what surprised me, and I know I have to bow down to you, your knowledge here with music and film, but there was no central motif. There was no, like, for me, this is the smart, like, if you listen to the If Chris Files soundtrack, you've got that motif coming in. For me, this is not a soundtrack that I would go out and buy on vinyl and listen. I listened to it once this morning. And then I thought about it, and I thought, well, actually, it's a really tough job to compose this, right? Because it isn't a movie full of action, Okay, there are some kind of tense scenes, but uh, not that many. The only real action, I think, is when we mentioned it with Gwilym and, and Tar having the fight, and then the I think the Esterhazy scene, maybe the end. But there's not a lot of you know. It must be really hard to compose music for such a you know a slow moving movie. 
Yeah, Iglesias does a great job with that. Like it's you're right. It does. It's not a it's not a main theme kind of movie, um, but it's the music does its job. You know, it serves its function. It's great background music. Um, it's unobtrusive, but it sets the tone so well. I think uh, even just during that that uh, Hungarian beginning, the tone is set by by the soundtrack as much as by the photography. It's uh, just puts us in that spy atmosphere and in the period. And it's interesting that I think coincidentally that Iglesias scored two Le Carre movies because he also did uh, The Constant Gardener. And they're pretty different scores, but they both suit their material really well. Uh, and I will just say, while you said you wouldn't go out and buy a vinyl, I know you're a collector too, and there is a limited edition vinyl of it. So uh-huh. you may want to try to get one of those numbers, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's it's one of those soundtracks that works in the movie, don't get me wrong, but in isolation, it didn't really move me when I listened to it this morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Martin, we, we can't see you. I hope uh, Carla's hoods haven't taken you away uh, and that you're, you're there. And oh, you can... I think Connie's been messing around with the camera settings again. <laughs> All right. Well, don't worry. We can hear you. That's the main thing. So uh, uh, anything that you heard us talk about there in the last 10 minutes or so that you wanted to chip in on? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've, I've not uh, been so much uh, taken by the soundtrack. It's one of the kind of things it, it's, it's um, so, uh, so restrained like much of the film that it's it's almost one of these things that you don't notice when it's there um uh, but uh it's, it's certainly it, it has to it. as to the production design I've, it's one of my bugbears increasingly where you see um an element of cgi is the world's not dirty enough you know we, we go back and we watch the uh you know, the, the classic brit series of the 70s and so on and you, you'll see that the, there's dirt on the streets and the buses aren't aren't popping red but uh other than that it, you know it's 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 great in terms of the styling and the the um the pods which as we've already said that they're, they're straight from um honorable schoolboy in many respects um certainly I, I can imagine enough of my uh teachers at various times in the 80s who hadn't hadn't changed their dress sense um that they'd have fitted in quite well with Bill in his tweedy suit and uh, various other looks. I think I think the only person who's got a decent suit out, out of that op- entire operation is uh, Percy Allerline, really. And um, the, in terms of the other nice bit of seventies uh, setting, is the uh, is the squash scene where yeah. um, we've got Lacon and the minister having a squash match, uh, getting all dead fit, and then they probably go to talk to Percy in the changing room and they. Puffing away as many fags as they possibly can <laughs> uh, to uh, get themselves back into the office routine, which I know is a great little contrast and sums it all up for me. There was also that scene in the Wimpy Bar, right, which reminded me of kind of seventies, early eighties. You don't see too many Wimpy. Oh yeah, yeah, anymore. yeah. And, um, yeah, you half wondered if someone had been watching a certain other TV show with Roy Marsden in at that point. And you're thinking, oh, yeah, OK. They've gone for the British chain rather than the American one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you on that. Um, we were saying before before you, you left us briefly that I like the sheepskin jacket um, that Ricky Tar wears. And I also love the corduroy, big, long corduroy coat that Hayden wears in that, that final scene when uh you know he's outed as the mole um just just i love that coat i mean i'd probably get laughed at if i wore it anywhere but what a coat that is yeah yeah i mean the 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 only person to some extent you wouldn't want to be in the film is mark strong who who ends up having this grown out um baldness effect that they, they've put on to him and, and he looks terrible for the entire film which i i guess is the uh that's the point because you know jim's in in a mess isn't he is uh half shot up and full of ptsd and has this massive sense of loss of everyone's betrayed him now the oil, the the owl scene in the classroom that actually happened to lakari didn't it jeff um I don't Matthew. know. I, Matthew might <laughs> I know read that about one. It I, somewhere. Yeah, I think it did happen. I think it was in Pigeon Tunnel, one of the books I read, where that that actually did happen to him. Um, I don't remember, but it rings a bell. I think yeah. you're probably yeah. right. Well, I, I all I know is if that happened to me, I'd be running out of the room, not smacking it with a <laughs> stick. That's for sure. 
But it was clever in the movie because that's how he won the res- the kids were teasing him about yeah. him, you know, his, you know, they're calling him what Quasimodo or whatever, and then he sorts the owl out and I, oof, okay, <laughs> it's not messed with this guy. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I thought they did that. His interaction with the Bill the Watcher was really good too. Um, that kid was was really good in that role, and and Strong did a really nice job of that creating that relationship in just a couple of scenes yeah and i also like the scene in budapest you know the the opener where he's going to meet the the leg man between him and the the supposed hungarian general i think he plays that very well although um that is a change from the book right because the book it happens in czechoslovakia isn't it but i think for budget reasons yeah they used uh used budapest yeah another thing that um and it's such a it's such a great scene in the book uh but totally makes sense you know it's another another thing that not only budgetary reasons of shooting there but uh just economy of storytelling we don't need the long drive you know and uh, the the joke telling is great in the book uh, building the tension and stuff but we're going to get tension in other places you know they get the tension right away in just the drop of sweat from the waiter falling on the table and uh it's just so many so many ways that uh they convey everything that happens you know all the same stuff happens that needs to happen narratively that happens in the Czechoslovakia sequence in the book, but it's contained to this one set, you know, to this one block. Um, and it, and this very short chunk of time instead of, uh, uh, you know, a drawn out chunk of time. And partly that, you know, that photography does it as we were talking about those, those really wide shots of, of seeing the street and all the people on it. Partly the acting does it partly the, um, the, you know, that drop of sweat does it like that is just such great and that's right there in the script like when you read that script all of that is described you know it's 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 even economical there it's maybe a few paragraphs but you get every person that's on that street you know you you get the description and they're they're on the on the screen just as they are on the page yeah before we uh, sorry jeff carry on Oh no! I was just gonna say, I just—it's amazing how they manage to translate the book into into visual images so well, and 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 use that because, like, I, I'm thinking of that when you get towards the end when Smiley is realizing what happened, right? And they use this—you know—the train tracks kind of shifting and the lights changing, and you get this whole sense yeah. of okay, he's putting it together. They've got the audio kind of replaying, and they use this visual trick to just show the audience okay this is what's happening again it's just really smart editing and and filmmaking yeah yeah or or again that christmas party we keep talking about that serves so many narrative functions and you get the Anne and hayden affair through that and smiley's memory of that which is a great quick visual way to do it when in the book it's so much in smiley's head and the stuff that he's blocking you know for most of the book he won't allow himself to remember which is exactly what carla takes advantage of in using it um in in that earlier Peter Morgan draft, which was you know a, a much longer uh, script, um, he'd introduced this whole subplot with with lawyers of so Smiley going to these divorce lawyers throughout the book, and the lawyers have hire private investigators, and that's how he finds this. And I I get why he felt the need to put it in there because it's not you know you need that not in Smiley's head, but the way they did it in the movie, they found a way to do that in just one scene. We dip back into that scene, but you know you don't need all these you know extra things brought in, and it's just it works really well. It's a great visual, like you say, Jeff. Before we talk about the finale, are there any other scenes you you, you want to bring up? Well, I'd just like to talk a little more about the one that Jeff mentioned of of uh, Gwilym stealing the file because that's my mm. favorite scene as well. Sure. I I think you know this is a movie as you said uh, without a lot of action, and as Martin pointed out, uh, you know there's not big there, there's no like Tom Cruise set pieces, but to me in a movie like this, that file scene becomes a set piece. It's the level of like, this came out the same year, 2011 was the same year that mission impossible ghost protocol came out, which has an extraordinary set piece of crews on the side of the Burj Khalifa building. And that year, both those scenes stood out equally to me as these, as the most memorable set pieces of the year, that crazy action. And this, a guy taking a a file out of a library, (laughs) you know, but it's, it's filmed so well. It, it really, and that is also my favorite chapter of the book. Yet that doesn't mean it can automatically be conveyed to the screen, uh, you know, so well. And it's, and indeed it's not done the same as it's done in the book, but 
they get the same effect again and they they make it so suspenseful as we're really with Willem who when we first introduce are introduced to him early on during that that general like um uh camera floating through the um the circus and when we get him as an outsider you know we see him through the window from the inside and coming in so he may not be exiled to Brixton in this but he's still clearly an outsider character in in the world of the circus and now he has the burden of smi- uh, spying for Smiley on top of that and he's got to steal a file from his own people and he's so nervous and Cumberbatch conveys that really well there's a lot of close shots you know even though we're moving through the building we're following close on his face and every interaction startles him you know we're we're kind of there with him and he doesn't play it like oh, I'm definitely spying on you. I'm a bumbling buffoon. You know, it's not like it would stand out and anybody would say that, but it is enough to get, to convey to us how nervous he is so that when we hear the janitor say something, you know, we're startled as well, just the way that he would be. And it just, and then the use of the song again, one of those cheesy seventies radio hit, I forget what it was, but it it just works so well. And yeah, yeah. Mr. And Wu, then yeah. conveys, sorry, Martin. What? Yeah, it's Mr. Wu, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Is is the song and that 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 whole creeping paranoia that doesn't even end when Gwillem's leaving the building because he he's he's going down the stairs and you think, oh, great, he, he's 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 got away, he's got away with it, and and um, I think it's Roy passes him on the stairs whistling the same song. Yes, and wow. and you're thinking, oh crap, they're going to get him even now. And of it's course, fantastic. they don't. But it's it's lovely, it's beautiful, just the way that all these little bits that are put in, as you say, even just having the the girl in the um, the archivist flirting him with him a bit, yeah, and yep. you can see he, he's sort of there saying, oh. How am I going to get out of this? I, I don't want to have this conversation. I want to go in and do this job that George has set me up to do. And all the boys think, oh, the clock's ticking. Come on, Peter, get out of there. Get out, get out, get out. And and he can't. It's yep. just great. But I think also, uh, Martin, you raise a really good point there because I think Peter Gwillem is acting straight. Like you see him look at the woman in the miniskirt, walk past him, and that situation there. You know, he's he's it's a double life even in his in his work. Well, uh, yeah, I I think Shane, that that's a, a really yeah. You know, don't care if people can't cope with a character being changed from from a book to a, to an adaptation, but this this version of Gwillem that we've got here is probably um, more concise and well defined than we get from Le Carre. I mean, Le Carre's a, a, a so and so largely through the book. You'll get bits chucked in at the last minute saying, "Oh, Gwillem is on the hard man course and yada 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 and everything else." But having we see Gwillem at the beginning, don't we, talking to Bill about one of the new girls, and, and he's not interested. As Belinda say, the he's, blonde. He's, he's the gay guy in the straight world there. Yeah. And all the way through, he's got more skin in the game because, one, he's going to have this relationship that he's not going to be allowed to have, and, two, he can get sacked just yeah. because of his sexuality. But that, that scene with Belinda the Blonde, I don't know if you've noticed, I didn't uh, until this morning, when, when Hayden smiles at her, he does this thing with his hands, they're quite creepy, but he kind of like wraps his hands as he's saying hello to her. It's like, like where did that come from? Was that just Colin Firth himself, or was it the director? Like, I'd love to know. Well, he, even to the extent, he, he rings the bike bell and, and nods with his head and to, to get the other girl to move out of the way so he can have a clearer view. And you're thinking, <laughs> this can't have been in the script. This must have been improvised. <laughs> Definitely. Um, what about you, Jeff? Favourite scene? Yeah, I mean, you know, that one is is definitely a highlight. I also, you know, I like the scene where Smiley comes home and Bill's there. Um, mm. And, you know he's playing it off like he just came to drop off that picture that we saw earlier but then they do that great shot of him in his shoes and he's just sliding his feet back into his untied shoes um yeah. you know that's just you know i so everybody knows what's going on really here um i thought that was really smart and then just you know all of this stuff was so so smartly done and I think this is why this movie does require multiple sittings, multiple watches. I mean, one, it's a pleasurable movie anyway to enjoy if you're a spy fan. 
um, certainly on the other spectrum from the actioneer movies. But there are these little things, that, and the one that stood out for me was when Prito is being tortured, and you see that smear of blood on the wall, and he, and, and then there's a woman oh, who's controlling the shot. sound. I'm sorry. After Irene has been shot. No, before, before you see him sat there, and you look at the wall. Mm. There's a smear of blood. And then you see the woman, like she's the Soviet officers are reading the newspaper. And the fact it's a woman that's doing, um, you know, playing the horrible screaming for him, uh, the torture. You know, again, it's just like that, you know, who decided to put that daub of blood on the wall? And you're right, Martin, after she gets shot, you, you look behind, there's a, like a little piece of brain that falls off the wall. I mean, it's, it's gross, mm. but it's so well done. And not necessarily picked up that's on a first see- viewing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that scene, I think that it, it ends with our only uh, real interaction with Carla, doesn't it? Where um, the, well, the, the figure sort of leans forward to Bill and says, uh, sorry, to, to Jim and says, oh, tell Alaline what I've done as a sign off. And you think, oh, Christ, you know, that's that's pretty brutal at the end. Yeah. Um, so just to wrap up here because I, I knew this would happen. We're just going over the hour mark. So let's talk about that finale. Um, let, let's start with you, Matthew. How was the end of the movie for you? Um, you mean the the finale in the safe house or the whole La Mer uh, La Mer, montage? The, well, we can talk about the safe house. How how did that play out for you? That the suspense around that scene. You know, actually, that scene in the safe house I find uh, slightly anticlimactic compared to to the book. Um, but the reason for that is is they're kind of saving. The, that's not the climax of the movie. The climax of the movie kind of comes afterwards in in, in Smiley's confrontation with Hayden in uh, at Sarat, um, and there, um, and and then the montage overall it works it works very well for me. Again, pulls in some stuff from Honorable Schoolboy in terms of Smiley's now the head of the circus. Um, my my only and the song the song works great to it you know they say uh, on the commentary or in the interviews that they wanted something you know a kind of cheesy 70s um song but uh but but that also works and that's what they get you know it t- it ties things together well my my only criticism of that ending is it feels a little too upbeat to me and i know mm. it's not in a lot of ways you know but just ending with with smiley at the desk instead of instead of putting up that picture of Carla, uh, you know, he's, he's got the chess piece, you know, with, with him. And that is another just brilliant visual thing that they do in the movie of making the suspects chess pieces like that it, it, from, from control carried on to smiley. Uh, but, it, but in the book, when he puts up that enlarged picture of Carla, you think, Oh, he's gone obsessed. You know, he, mm. he's a little crazy here. Whereas in the movie, I feel more like, no, Smiley's in the right place. He's in charge. He's sitting in front of the big yellow background. And and now the future is good at the circus because the right person is is in charge. And that's definitely not the feeling that the book leaves me with. So I guess that would be my, my one criticism of that finale is that it's ultimately a little too upbeat, even if everyone's just had their hearts broken and by this cr- critical be- betrayal. Um, it ends on a more happy note that I'm used to from Le Carre. Yeah, and I think, Matthew, you know, I agree. I think Le Maire was a good choice. But at the end, you have that applause when Smiley just done, which is from the track. It's the live track. It's a live, you know, at first I thought that had been added in, and I didn't like that, but it's a part of the track. So I, I would have muted that personally. Mm. How about you, Jeff? How was the, the finale, the climax for you? Um, I think it it worked for me, you know. I mean, I think we get that great moment, like, you know, we've been talking about with Smiley confronting Hayden too, where you just, you Mm. finally see that passion. Right. And so, um, I, I I just felt it it worked. It it paid off all of the, the characters that we've seen throughout, you know, we get these flashbacks, you know, cuts to the various characters and we're seeing them. And it it was kind of like, it was a little bit though. I will say it was a little, you know, Dawson's creaky, you know, uh, if, if, if folks of my age know that show, it's like the teen shows, like, uh, you know, they always end in that musical montage, you know, where you see everybody, they're looking a little mournful, they're looking out there and then, you know, then it kind of wraps things up. Um, <laughs> so for me, that was a bit of a flashback, but I, 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 I didn't mind not 
ending on a complete down note. Um, so it, it worked for me. That that scene with Hayden, there's a couple of things I like about it, Jeff. In particular, when Smiley's going in, Alaline's coming out, and he's absolutely destroyed, isn't he? Just, I mean, great acting there by by Toby Jones. Um, but just, and he's soaking. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, really, I, I love that. And then also, you know, for me, um, the fact they're all so civil about it, and Smiley's going to go and help with a little bit of housekeeping. You know, you think that they'd be kicking the shit out of him in some room right but it's it's that kind of the, the british system almost the the snobbery there where they, they're treating each almost like a prisoner of war i you know it's uh it's it's interesting to me that that whole thing i do think it's interesting that they changed some things from an er- earlier draft of the script that i have where there was more dialogue at the end and you have actually hayden and preto talking to each other um and Hayden is looking at the the cadets running around and and says to to Jim, just like us, Jim, best days, you know, echoing Connie's earlier uh, talk about her boys and their best days early on, which which is, um, you know, that's a powerful line. So I'm I'm sort of sad that they left it out, but the visual again, they just find a way and. and in the book, obviously, Jim breaks his neck. In the movie, he shoots him from from afar, but the boy the bullet goes in like a tear right underneath his eye and then echoes the tear that's on jim's cheek as as he does it it just works very well visually and 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 works with that montage so you don't need the dialogue so matthew for you and maybe this is in the book and it's been a while since i've read it that act by prido shooting uh hayden was it an act of revenge or an act of love that's that is the question of of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. I think uh, the book a, and the the adaptations, and you know, I've never come to a, a full conclusion on that. Each time I read it, I think slightly differently of it. And and same see, seeing the movie, I, I think the movie makes it a little more an act of love. Uh, I guess partly because of that match on the on the blood and the tear. Um, so I think maybe that Alfredson takes a little bit more of a stand on it than Lecare does. Um, but, uh, but there, yeah, there's times that I read the book and I totally think it's, it's, it's revenge. Um, and, and you could certainly interpret the movie both ways as well, but the movie leads me thinking love. How about you, Martin? I, I, yeah, I, I sort of, uh, puzzled over this one myself. I, I, I've come down on to sort of the, the opposite side of, when Matthews, I, I think it's almost like uh, Jim's kind of resolving a rejection of his unrequited love for for Bill, and and he just you know you, you see him go through this this process of um, distancing himself from the boy at the school, saying, "Oh, don't come round here, I don't want to be involved with you anymore," and, he, and it's almost as if there's a resolution then in Jim at that point that he's he's saying, "Well, I've got to end." my relationship with bill as well and i'm gonna do it by by killing him because he's betrayed me every step of the way and not protected me um which i think is and i agree actually with matthew that the 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 end scene in that respect is um between uh, um jim and bill and the ending in the shooting it, it really is it doesn't need any words it's just two actors with their expressions towards each other it's far more powerful by having no dialogue i think it really is um very impactful very impactful indeed how about you jeff yeah i mean i i would say i think it's a act of of revenge over betrayal of of a love that was given and 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 destroyed you know i mean i i think it does it does feel like he is he is taking his revenge on him but it's it's obviously wrapped up in all of his his love for Hayden as well you know and Mm. so it it really by the time you get to the end of the movie with 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 Jim Prido you're just he's the one that you feel the most for I think in the whole the whole film right um because of of what he's gone through and what he's lost and Hayden I mean that scene with Smiley where we see him talking to him and he's like oh here you know give a little money to this this girl and then this boy to shut him up I mean he's just he's totally 
unrepentant, you know, he doesn't, whatever he did, does he care? I don't know. I don't think he cares about the impact that he had on the, the people around him that he betrayed. Um, Just like Kim Philby, <clears throat> which is a whole other discussion there, of course. But I mean, with Hayden, I think that is my favorite scene, that Lemaire scene. I just love how he snakes onto the dance floor and he's look, I mean, it's just superb acting by Colin Firth. So where do you come down on the lover betrayal, Shane? So um, from the movie, I definitely think it was love. And I think the fact that maybe I'm reading too much into it, you know, Hayden doesn't shout, he doesn't scream. It's almost like Hayden's like, yeah, take me out because I don't want to go to Russia. I'm done. Um, so I, I think it's more on the love side. But when I read the book, I didn't necessarily think that. Yeah. Do you think he sees Prido? I, I did that seemed kind of vague to me in the in the movie when I was watching that. He just kind of looks. I think he does. I think he kind of sees him, and there's that little moment. And again, you know, who and really that, knows? We have to get Alfredson on here. Yeah, although that's something that's come to me through rewatches. The first time I saw it, I didn't think that he saw him, but right. but after rewatching it over the years, I think he does see him. I mean. It, there seems to be recognition on his face and maybe it's just acceptance of his fate, but I think it's, I think it's, you know, even if he doesn't see him, he's thinking about Jim at that moment. Like, so as we wrap up then, we're, we're going to cover more Lacare's movies, but where does this stand for you in, in all the Lacare movies that have been produced? Um, Jeff, we'll start with yourself. Where, where does this one stand? I, it's, it's really strong. Now I'm not, uh, Matthew Bradford. I haven't seen them all. Shame on me. But uh, I, I, I think it's it's very. I, for me, the the gold standard is still the Constant Gardener. That's a film that that took the book and elevated it so much. Um, but I love Tinker Taylor as well. So, you know, strong strong number two. How about you, Martin? Oh, I'd say it's gonna be. Two or three for me, and um, of of the ones I've seen, and uh, certainly I've not I've not seen so many of the more recent films. Um, I think Spy Who Came In from the Cold just edges it for me, in that it's uh, it's a a darker film, and of course it's got this crazy performance from Richard Burton in it, uh, which is just uh, mind blowing. Uh, what he goes through, so um, I'll I'll be interested to see when I when I come to rewatch Spy Who Came In From The Cold, whether that does just I think it does just edge it over Tinker Taylor, but it's very close. I'm curious to know if our opinion will change by the time we finish the movie club series. Will will things have, we talked about this about Bond themes on on the Facebook community, Matthew? Like you know your favorite Bond theme changes week to week. I wonder if you know what what we're saying now, where Tinker Taylor is in our in our favorites if that will change by the time we get through them all i I wonder uh and and for me yeah they they could because it's definitely neck and neck with spy who came in from the cold for me but i i think tinker taylor is actually my favorite movie i'm not counting tv here but my favorite movie adaptation of of john le carre is is thomas alfredson's tinker taylor soldier spy just narrowly edging out spy who came in from the cold but it's possible in the week that we watch that 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 my my feelings might change because that is just a stunning movie as well but uh this this movie if i want to get in the the visual space of what i imagine when reading the books this is it for me you know the 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 visuals of this movie is just like climbing into the book it is that it brings to life that 70s london um circus world so vividly um so viscerally too like the the look and the performances and and the the sound design everything is really just combining to give me you know someone actually just asked me this recently of what what is the movie uh i should see um i'm getting into john le carré uh movies i want to know what and i said this is the one to watch um like i think it is yeah if i had to tell someone just just one movie as i just did that this would be the one that mm-hmm. i would say you know that's your barometer if you like that then go down and watch the others but uh if you don't like it i don't think you need to because it this is is the like 
it encompasses and encapsulates all that that I love about uh, Le Carre's writing and his world. So you you obviously run the Lakari podcast. You're you're very close to what's going on with the Lakari estate and so forth. So my understanding is there's not likely to be a sequel to this, right? Oldman's not likely to be returning a smiley. Yeah, I think at this point, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that you know whatever momentum was there for this has has fizzled at this point and. I, this wasn't done by with any association with the Ink Factory at that point, right? Mm. So I think that now no, this that, was Ink Factory. Was it? Was it? Okay, yeah. good. So there, there's that. But I, I just it feels like the momentum is gone for for this. I don't know, Matthew. Maybe you hear something more in the tea leaves. But I think at this point, you know, we're ten years on. The idea of getting a sequel seems kind of slim. Yeah, and getting exactly. these actors back think... together again, right? Right, especially yeah, now, like everyone's a movie star who's in smaller roles but uh but i think they would if it happened i suspect you could get these people back because because of the passion i mean oldman speaks very passionately about it i think he'd certainly still do it should it happen but like you say i one i don't think it's you know likely after 11 years two the ink factory is clearly moving in a different direction developing their tv smiley they might not want to compete with that with another oldman movie and three, you know, once Oldman has been Jackson Lamb, can he be Smiley again? I'm I'm not sure, honestly. But um, but I I did I had the chance to meet um uh Peter Strawn, the co-writer of the movie, and asked him if he was working on the Honorable Schoolboy. And at that time, this is years ago, he said no. He was working on Smiley's People. That would be that they were were going to do a sequel, and they wanted it to be Smiley's People. Uh, and he said that was because of budgetary reasons that, you know, just like BBC couldn't shoot in the Far East in the 70s, working title uh, found that prohibitive to shoot both in Hong Kong and more and period Hong Kong, you know, to set dress it the way they set dress London. Um, I don't know, that never totally rang true with me. I, I see a lot of productions that do manage that but um but that's what he said but he did also say that he was going to combine elements from honorable schoolboy into his smiley's people adaptation that was the plan at that point and um so we were going to get some some things from that uh in there including starting with smiley being the head of the circus um which I mean, that's obviously a pretty different beginning than Smiley's People, which very strongly again begins with Smiley as an outsider brought in. So it, w- it would be interesting to see what what they would have brought in from that. But I don't think we'll ever get the chance to see that now, sadly. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to see Oldman back, even if it was just for the third one um, to kind yeah. of finish that storyline. And I was amazed that you talk about budget that. From what I've read, Tinker Tailor Service Spy was twenty one million dollars. Wow. Which is I not didn't much. It was that little. Yeah. Yeah. That's astounding what they did. I mean, for I thought that. Gary'd be on twenty million himself, but uh <laughs> twenty one million, which is uh, pretty incredible for what they've delivered. Sure is. Excellent. So which uh, which movie are we gonna tackle next? Are we gonna take them in order or how do you feel? Well, I mean, we haven't started in order, so um, <laughs> there's no need, really. Uh, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, well, they did just wh- announce uh, a most wanted man is a the new TV production, right? That's coming. So I don't know if that makes yeah. sense to talk about. Hey, I I'm game. How's everyone else feel? Yeah, yeah that, sounds I mean, good. I'd cool love to, to me. talk about that. But I'd also, it could be cool to jump back and forth and do like a 60s one and then another modern mm. one and kind of go go between the eras. But um, sure. But yeah. We'll talk about yeah. them all eventually, right? Yeah. So. Well, I'm excited because I also haven't watched them all. I mean, I haven't seen Little Drummer Girl, uh, the film adaptation. I have, believe it or not, I've not seen Constant Gardener, Jeff. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited your, for this. Get to your tissues ready. Some new movies. So where does Tinker Taylor fall for you right now at the beginning of this journey, uh, Shane, like in terms of ranking what you've seen? Believe it or not, despite my obsession with Berlin and East Germany, this is number one. It's going to, you know, Spiral of Me is, is up there for me. Spiral of Me, beg your pardon. <laughs> that is up there for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, spoken from the cold. But uh, yeah, this, this is this. It's, I actually have to say, I think this is my all time favorite spy movie. It hits all the notes for me. 
Yeah. Uh, huge, huge fan. And, you know, it's amazing what the screenwriters were able to do, what Alfredson was able to, to direct and produce and what the actors delivered. I mean, this is, you know, again, I watched it this morning. I don't know how many times I've watched it. But again, uh, I'm like, oh, I need to read the book. Every time I w- watch this movie, it's like, I want to go read the book again. I want to go to the original source. Well, you know, yeah, I, I feel that way too. Uh, but what's interesting is this happened to work out well for me because I had tried an experiment a few years ago. I usually reread the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy every couple of years. Like I, I've read it a number of times over the years since I first read it. It's it's my, as I say, my favorite book. I love rereading it. But a couple of years ago, I decided I'm not going to reread it because I want to, I want to go in the reverse direction and watch the movie and then listen to the radio adaptation and then watch the miniseries and then read the book and Mm. and sort of see all those things without the book looming directly over them, um, you know, going, going in reverse order. And that was a few years ago and I didn't get to it and I still hadn't done it and I had not gone back to the book again. So now it's actually been the longest that it's, since I first read the book, it's been the longest that it's ever been since reading the book. So it was cool to see this movie in as close as I can to sort of fresh eyes. It's obviously, yeah. a, it's not the equivalent of like Jeff, your wife seeing it, you know, because I do have all that in my head, but I hadn't read it recently and I was, it, it was kind of a new experience. I was able to judge it more on its own merits. And I, I, I think it passed the test completely. It holds up as a, as a really just terrific spy movie without mm-hmm. without the book in my head uh you know immediately in my head anyway as well and i can i can absolutely see how people are confused by it you know how some people come to it and you know it, it, it that's that's a legitimate response 100 percent. but um but i think it works you know it, it, even even if you're confused i think the story comes across you know even if yeah. you can't tell the details of the the gold dust or treasure as they call it in the movie and the chicken feed like ultimately i think the emotional story comes through no matter what so it just works and i'd say the only thing keeping it from being the quintessential spy movie is that lack of a quintessential spy theme that you talked yes. about shane because to me yeah. that is sort of like entrenched in the genre there that you know a lot of them have that um but even despite that, yeah, it's a strong contender for my number one spy movie as well. It's just a terrific, terrific movie, I think. And for anyone who wants to go out and buy it, although we've, we've gone all over spoilers here, which, you know, the movie was out in 2011. So um, is there a, a definitive DVD edition that you recommend? Um, a new version just came out in England uh, last year for the 10th anniversary, or maybe it was this year, but it was for the 10th anniversary that... Uh, is the 4K, the first 4K release and Blu-ray, and it has new special features on it. Comes in a really nice slipcase designed by the artist who did those Penguin paperback editions of the of the novels. Uh, and that that's pretty comprehensive. It is coming out in America in a 4K uh, in, I think, February, uh, January or February from Kino Lorber. I don't know if they're going to port over all the special features that the English version has or not. They're definitely not going to have the bells and whistles of the slipcase and the poster that it comes with. Uh, And if you do have a 4K player, those are region free. Like there is no regioning like there was for DVDs and Blu-rays. So anyone in America with that player can order this UK 4K uh, anniversary edition and be able to play it. Wow, I wasn't aware of that. So uh, thank you for the intel. Uh, you're welcome excellent well gentlemen thank you very much for today i've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and i'm really excited to, to hit more uh jlc movie adaptations great thanks for having thank me you guys great discussion excellent stuff i will great, add all the show stuff. notes because matthew and jeff have websites and podcasts and blogs martin do you uh, do you have a uh, a blog or or anything that we can link to no, no, I'll I just, I just lurk around on the Facebook group and uh, take the mickey out of Jason King periodically. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not hard. He, he wanted a make today, but he's been invited out to dinner somewhere, so someone else is putting up with him. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, yeah. thank you for today. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you, Shane. Great, thanks. Well, that was quintessential spy breed. That's exactly why I set this podcast and our community up. I hope to you it felt like you were down the pub with a couple of fellow spy fans who were talking about a, a movie that they watch. And that's what we try and do here on Spybury, whether it be a movie or a book or a TV show. 
spy music spy games we, we chat a lot and if you are looking for good quality conversation with fellow spy fans do check out our community it's online where we're going towards 3000 fellow spy fans who are in that community and you can find that at spybury.com forward slash facebook until next time cheerio Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.